We are a Christian organization that strives to transform the culture and influence public policy in Ireland with the wisdom and love of God. What is Christian Voice of Ireland? Christian Voice of Ireland is pastors with the same beliefs coming together and expressing who the Lord is, His place in this land, mm -hmm. iron sharpening iron. We equip and empower Christians to engage with the public sphere on issues such as abortion, marriage, family, religious freedom, social justice, and other matters of public benefit. Like a lot of time the trans discussion is about men who want to become women, but I think a lot of what you're seeing is that, you know, teenage girls who are very uncomfortable in their bodies due to puberty or whatever, if you saw some path, what you think is going to make you happy, you'd be very vulnerable to going along with that. We collaborate with churches, ministries and individuals who share our vision and mission. What is CVI for you and why are you part of it? Um, we see that CVI is really like a voice in the nation. We need to stand in unity. You know, with so many Christians, we may not all be of the same stream, but we can be united in our values of human life, marriage, of our children, male or female. CVI, I, I guess an umbrella, we can come under and have unity together, be a voice in this nation, and um, be a voice to, to the government, and to really stand up these agendas that are coming that are just totally against the Word of God and totally against family mm. values. And one of our focuses is to join people from different parts of Christianity to come together to break the divide that shouldn't be there and start working together. So this aligned very much with where we feel Christianity should be going in Ireland. Together we can do much more for the community, for the nation. We're standing with Christian Voice Ireland. To me it's a voice, a Christian voice. The more of us that are united together as a voice, I think is important. Um, it's united people as well and brought the church together. Jesus said, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. Often the church has been split and divided over various different things and, and really it's time to look at all the positives and the things that we have in common and to work together. A house divided shall not stand. I, get, I encourage any leader to consider to be part of this movement because that is our time now to come together and uh, to be a strong voice in Ireland. To be a voice of truth and justice in Ireland. Proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and defending the dignity of every human life. Good evening, everybody. It is my very great pleasure to welcome all of you here to the stadium this evening. Uh, I know that there's many different church communities that are represented here tonight, and we're so glad that you made the effort to come here. Uh, you might be here, you might not be affiliated to any particular church, you're very welcome as well. And I know that there's members of other faiths here as well, members of the Muslim community here too tonight. And so we want to extend to you a very warm welcome. Uh, we're very glad that you're here, yes. So my first announcement is if everybody could please put their phones on silent uh, so we don't have any disruptions during the evening. Uh, we also have a table outside as you exit into the foyer. We have a number of leaflets that are available to inform on uh, material that is available for teachers teaching SPHE. So we do invite you to take some of those flyers with you and distribute them. We have had many of them printed. And on that note, there'll be a QR code available. Um, if you feel it on your heart, there's no obligation to do so. But if you would like to support financially, obviously printing these flyers uh, takes uh, a financial cost. So if you'd like to contribute, there'll be a QR code. Uh, it would lead, lead you to a PayPal screen and you can pay through credit card or other means through the PayPal link. So uh, we'd appreciate that. Um, there'll also be a QR code available on the screen if you'd like to submit uh, a question electronically that can be considered by the panel uh, at the end of this session. So please uh, do avail of that option as well. Uh, we have some great speakers here this evening. Um, we have Pastor Tunde is here. He's very welcome. We're excited to hear him speak. Yes. 
We have Senator Sharon uh, Keoghan. We're very uh, honored to have you here this evening. We have Ben Scanlon from Gript, so we're very glad to have you speaking this evening. Uh, we have our own Teresa Clulo, who's going to speak from a mother's perspective. Very important. Uh, and of course, Pastor John Ahern. Uh, so it's going to be a great night. Um, and I'll hand over to Pastor Jay Seelan, who's going to just open with a prayer. It's our great privilege and honor to be here to come and seek the Lord and to get the information in behalf of the generation yet to come and the generation who is in this land. And it's important that we wel welcome God's presence, whatever we do, because the Bible says it's not by might, not by power, but by His Holy Spirit. When God comes, we can have the extraordinary God's strength in all the effort we are doing. So I'd like to encourage if you can stand on your feet as we're going to pray and start with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we worship you, we honor you. We lift up your holy name, my God, my Father. We thank you, Lord, that you ordained this evening for your Lord God, for your children to come together and look into your face. As the Bible says, those who are looking unto you, that you will not put us into shame. You will, Lord, shine with your radiance, O God, my Father in heaven. All our preparation, all the information, every effort, O God, we bring into your mighty hand. Lord God, my Father, is all about your creation. We pray that you will take control over everything. You will do extraordinary things, O God, above all that we are going to deliver today. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our fight is not against flesh and blood. Our fight is against the powers and principality, which is operating over the city and the nation. In the mighty name of Jesus, we come against, O God, every territorial spirit, every stronghold of the demon that is instating God, my Father, through any, Lord God, any tools in this nation, O God, my Father, we bind and arrest and demolish and destroy them now in the heavenly realm. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, you take control over. Lord, victory belongs to God. We take a victory by your name, O God, my Father in heaven. We give all the glory and honor and adoration to you, God, my Lord. In Jesus' name, we ask this prayer. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Gian Paolo Valero. Um, uh, I work uh, as the director of Christian Voice Ireland, and I'm here to invite you to join uh, our group. Um, Christian Voice Ireland is a group that I'm proud of, to be part of, um, and we strive to transform the culture and influence uh, the, the public uh, policy in Ireland with the wisdom and love of God. We equip and empower Christians to engage with the, uh, with the public sphere on issues such as abortion, marriage, family, religious freedom, social justice, and other matters of public benefit. We collaborate with churches, ministries, and individuals who share our vision and our mission. Our vision is to be a voice for truth and justice in Ireland and proclaiming the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and defending the dignity of every human life. We believe that God has a plan and a purpose for this nation and that we are called to be a salt and light in the world. We believe that by speaking up for what is right and good, we can make a positive difference in our society. I wanted to share a little bit why this is important to me, and I think the best way to do it is to share a little bit of my personal story. I'm from Venezuela, uh, a country that in the 1960s had the fifth largest economy, and at its peak, it held a currency that was stronger than the dollar. Since 1999, we've had a democratic elected government that turned authoritarian. The thing, the thing with, authorities, uh, with authoritarian governments is that you don't realize your freedoms are taken away until it's too late. In the name of peace, inclusion, and tolerance, freedoms are being stripped away little by little. I've always wondered what would have happened if as Christians we would have been united not to fight politically, but to shine a line in times of darkness, to stand up for faith in our values, to be a voice for the voiceless and the oppressed, to show you the love of God to those who are hurting and hopeless. And now I'm here. I, I came for six months to study, 
But this amazing land enamored me and my wife, and now we have made this land our home for the last nine years. We even have two Irish kids. Who would have thought of that? And now I feel so Irish, like truly Irish. I even have an Irish passport. I, I celebrate when the Irish rugby team beats South Africa, for example. <laughs> I, I watch the final Gael Gaelic football and enjoy the clash of the ashes. But I also see some challenges the, and threats that are facing this country that I love. I see some of the same signs of erosion and democracy uh, and human rights that I witnessed in Venezuela. I see some of the same attempts to silence or marginalize Christians who dare to speak out against injustice or immorality. I see some, of the, uh, some pressures to conform or compromise our beliefs and values. And that is why we started Christian Voice Ireland. Because we want to create a movement that is not afraid to stand up for what is right and good. Because we want to create a community that supports and encourages each other in our faith and, 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 and be witnesses to this world. Because we want to be part of a mission that seeks to bring hope and healing to our nation. And I invite you to join us in this journey. If you're an Im immigrant like me, join CBI. Don't let others shape the country that you've made your home. And if you're Irish, join CBI. Act sooner than, re than later. Together we can make a difference, and together we can be a voice for truth and justice in Ireland. Thank you for your attention, and God bless you. <laughs> Teresa. Good evening, everyone. Can I have a wave from all the moms and dads? It's great to see you. <laughs> Is nobody better to fight for a cause if you have children yourself, you know? And I want to open just to say, I'm not here today to say that I hate anybody, that I think some people are of less value than what I am or that what we believe. Um, I'm here to say that I'm a mother of three teenagers, and it's my responsibility to make sure that whatever goes into their hearts and minds is the right thing and the age-appropriate thing for that child at that time. And I want to encourage you, as I'm going to share one or two things that we have experienced as a family, I, I feel the weight that I'm representing a lot of moms to here today. I'm representing parents, but not only the parents, I'm representing the children. Because sometimes they are overlooked. Sometimes all these things are just thrown into their laps and it's like feeding them, them something that they don't eat. And just say, no, 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 eat up, eat up. No, one last bite. No, 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 you won't get a sweet before you finish your food. You know, it's, it's force-fed a lot of the times, and I don't think that is fair, and I don't think children's voices are really being heard. I would like to share from persp personal perspective as a mom of three teenagers about how we experience these changes. I know from talking to many parents about this, that this is steadily a rise of concern about all the changes that is bring, being brought into school. From the first day my eldest went to junior infant, I made it a point to make an appointment with the teachers and to meet up with them and ask them about the curriculum, especially when it comes to sex education. And it's just something I've always done. My meetings were always well received, and I felt that I could play open cards with the teachers about my preference to teach my children myself about sexual development and proposed topics to be covered. Some even gave me a lend of the movies they were to watch during the course of the year, and I felt that I had more control over what my children were exposed to. Even give them a heads up of what is coming. It was important for us as parents to have the first input, to lay the foundations the way we believed is right and age-appropriate to them. If topics were to be discussed that we felt might not be, they might not be ready to be exposed to, we would take our kids out of the class for that subject, and they were never an eyebrow raised over it. It was a, collabor a collaboration of educating our children in mutual respectful ways and understanding that the primary responsibility of educating our children still lies with the parents. One year, I was doing the same thing. I went to see a teacher and discuss how we preferred to know in advance about sex education topics to be covered, and I asked if it's okay if I could see the curriculum on it. This year was different. 
The teacher laughed at me. His reply to me was, Miss Clulo, just so that you know, I have been teaching the boys for a very long time about sexuality and sex orientation by means of using Lego. I feel it is important that you understand that none of this is written in a curriculum. It is my responsibility to make sure that every child that walks through my door will know about different preferences and families, to combat bullying and respect every person, including their differences. I was shocked. I never anticipated that anyone will steer away from the curriculum. As long as I knew what the curriculum said, I felt that it was going to be fine. Now, this man has spent an unknown amount of time with my child, with an obsession and an agenda to teach them, without my consent, about things that they were way too young for. He was only five at the time. My heart broke, and it still is broken. All these years, I have been trying to protect my child and all my children from being exposed to these things too soon was over. The race was on, and I realized if I do not really get stuck in and involve myself with what they learn every single day, someone else will gladly grab that opportunity and lay foundations and plant tiny seeds in their heads. Fast forward years later, I am so grateful for all the effort we have made to stay connected with our children during this whole time. I urge every parent to do the same. These are topics that are very uncomfortable to talk about, even with an adult, let alone your own children, the questions they ask. <laughs> But I can assure you, if you do not step up and lay the foundations of what you believe is morally right and carry value for you and your household, someone else will jump in and do that for you. There will be a whole forest of beliefs planted in your child's head and heart, nurtured over time, every single day, little bits at a time, creating beliefs so strong that you will have no way of giving an input or challenge them on it. A few years back, one of my children came home from school and they were distraught. After investigating, it turned out that they were learning that day in school how two men have sex. Then followed a couple of disturbing questions, and we had the daunting task of explaining what oral sex is. They were not ready for this information, but if we did not answer the questions and brought it back into perspective of what our standards and beliefs are, I can assure you again, someone else would have gladly filled those gaps for us. It is so important to know what is written in your child's book. It is our responsibility as parents to pick up those books and read them. Because it's not just about the pictures. It's not just about flicking through what is written in those books and taught every single day. As a Christian family, we base all our teachings and beliefs on the Bible. We will always tell the kids, bring it back to the Word of God. What does the Bible say? Does it line up with the Word of God? But even if you are not a Bible-believing family, there is so much wrong with introducing a child to pornography. Some of us might have polarized opinions on new curriculum, but I can bet you this topic is the one topic that any family can agree on. I am yet to find a parent that thinks it is a good idea. All the statistics that they build reasoning upon by means of surveys and conducting, uh, that was conducted by an X amount of parents, I doubt that. I haven't seen a survey. Who in this room have actually conducted a survey on allowing pornography to be taught to our 12-year-olds? I am yet to find somebody. This alone should have your blood boiling. The excuse is to teach our kids about pornography so that they won't be so aggressive about it, so they would learn about the dangers of pornography in a safe environment, that kids nowadays are turning to pornography for sex education. Not in every household. Not in my household. All these little changes are, they're bringing in is pure indoctrination. 
Adults have a problem staying away from porn. How is this going to help a 12-year-old to have more wisdom, more restraint, more discipline to stay away from pornography? You can speak to any profession offering counselling and ask their opinion on what effect pornography has on an adult. This is child grooming, I'm sorry. Any person eager to teach my child about sex, sexuality, sex orientation, and everything related to it, I have a huge question mark behind. There is an agenda, I'm sorry. I can men mention plenty of things that my kids have experienced so far in the process of this whole agenda. But I assure you, the very same thing is happening in your child's school right now. These are not isolated situations. These are fruits of seed planted years ago and nurtured to maturity so that even our children believe that it's normal and right. Now these topics are in the curriculum. These changes are not inclusive because it's very clear that religion and opposing beliefs are frowned upon. If the kids have different values and beliefs, it feels to them that they have committed a crime. I am curious to know if given the choice how many students will actually pick these subjects as part of their education. The system is definitely not that inclusive as they make it out to be. One of my boys' teachers asked him to stay behind after class one day. When they were alone, she said to him, he must please understand that she does also not agree with the discussions, but that she felt exactly the way he did. That day, it was like she's given him a gift. He felt like he was going off his head, like he's the only one that did not agree with some of the things that were taught. I understand not all teachers agree with what is being taught, and I understand that many feel the way we do as parents. It is time to make waves about this. It is time. There is a saying that says, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Have you heard of that? It's time to start squeaking. I'm sorry. Contact your school. Oppose the introduction to pornography to the junior cert. Contact your local TDs. Stay connected with groups like CVI who are willing to fight for this course. Come to the meetings. Sign every petition going about this if you can find them. If we all do this, it has to be brought to the right people's attention. We can only make a difference if we all step up and speak out. It is not too late. There is power in numbers. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. That's a lame response. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Honestly, thank you. I'm very well done to Teresa. Well said. And I also want to thank Pastor John, Pastor Joanna for putting this together. You know, the Bible teaches me that everything works together for good. If they didn't come up with what they've attempted to come up with, we won't be here tonight. A lot of us won't be united as we are. Because now, like Teresa said, the race is on. Uh, we're in battle. And by God's grace, we will win. You know, it, it, the, the, the battle is almost laughable. The things they are proposing are, all, are so ridiculous that we have to take them seriously. And like she said as well, there is strength in numbers. There is victory in unity. We stand united. The days of us being so, so civilized that we don't confront things that want to overtake us, those days are over. It's our responsibility to speak up. It's our responsibility to make sure they don't overturn the right things. And God has to help us. God will help us. Permit me to read um, scripture. I appreciate that there are people here from other faiths and um, some with no faith. But permit me to read scripture. In Proverbs 22 and verse 6, Proverbs 22 and verse 6, the Bible says, Train up a child in the way he should go. 
and when he's old, he will not depart from it. It was beautiful to hear a mother's perspective. Um, maybe the next time we meet, we'll hear a father's perspective. Uh, but the truth is, most of us are parents and we understand. With what is going on, I want to encourage us as parents to make sure our children know what we stand for. It's very important because if you don't teach them at home, they're going to learn from outside. And what they'll learn from outside will be strong enough to affect the home front. You know, the Bible says if the foundation be destroyed, what will the righteous do? So we need to make sure the foundation is strong because they are, this generation is exposed to a lot of things, especially through social media. And a lot of their thinking is framed based on what they, what they witness on social, social media. So it's not just the school system, it's not just the SPHE stuff. Um, we need to make sure our children are well, well brought up. They understand who we are, what we stand for. And they understand that if you go out there and you hear things that are contrary to what your parents are teaching you, then you should be strong enough to say no. You know, we're talking about them opting out of, of these classes. Thank God, that means we're taking a stand. But that's not strong enough. Because even if we take them out of the classes, during other times, on the playground, as they go to school on the bus with their mates, as they fellowship or hang out with their friends, they'll tell them what is being taught anyway. Children are extremely curious. I wasn't in this lesson, what do they teach you? And it will have a way of affecting them because their minds are still fragile. You know, they're influenced by things around them. You know, the truth is, as Christians, permit me to, to say that, we are being bullied. And that's the truth. And we can't speak out because if we speak out, they'll say we are bullying them. So it's a case of reverse psychology. But we stand for the truth and we must speak the truth at all times. You know, we must speak the truth at all times. We're not going to let them shut us up. No, no, no way. You know, so it's important because the children also, we don't want them to step out of class and then they look like they're the odd ones out. You know, a lot of the times as Christians, we swim against the tide. But sometimes our children are not strong enough. So we need to spend time. We need to teach them. We need to let them know who we are. We need to let them understand that from time to time. Um, it, 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 and it's interesting because it's a minority that is making so much noise that they're drowning out the voice of the majority. We need to let our children understand who they are, be confident in this God that they serve. And sometimes it's just simply based on morals. For those that are of no faith, everybody knows this is wrong. Well, most people, let's not say everybody, because the minority is pushing this. And like Teresa said, it's a form of grooming. It's a form of grooming. A lot of the children will get into these activities not because they want to, but because they don't want to look like the odd ones out, which is a very dangerous thing. And that's another form of bullying. They're bullying our children into things that, that should not be. You know, how, how, we, how do we talk about biology now being called gender identity? There's no such thing. It's X, 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 Y. And thank God they can't change that. Thank God they can't change that. You know, so for us, it's the foundation. Make sure the foundation is right. Is it too late? It's never too late. Never too late. I serve a God that performs miracles. I serve a God that is in the business of testimonies. I serve a God that turns things the right side up. So it's never too late. As long as we have breath in us, we will indulge in what I would call an enlightenment campaign. So they don't think that we're a bunch of people that are, although the Bible says, the Bible says, it says the kingdom suffers violence and the violent take it by force. We're not physically violent. We never will be, but we get violent in the place of prayer. Uh, we stay in the place of prayer and we pray until the Lord gives us the, the what to do. We hear from God in the place of prayer. So we get violent because this is an affront. This is battle. They're trying to, they're trying to steal the future of our children. We're not going to sit down and watch this happen. God forbid. Not on our watch. God forbid. So we get violent in the place of prayer and we do the right thing. God will show us what to do. It's never too late. God reverses the irreversible. God is in the business of doing what the world will call impossible. 
You know, we were, we were sharing yesterday, um, Pastor John called a meeting of leaders, and I said, I, I strongly believe we need to pray for those in charge that they'll give their lives to Jesus. I, I, I completely believe that. One of the ways we're going to fight this is to pray for the salvation of these people. Let them see the light because they're in darkness. In John chapter 1 verse 5, the Bible says the light shines and darkness has no power over it. It's time for our light to shine. It's time for us to stand up and let the world know what we believe in, what we believe completely. Otherwise, anything less than that, we are failing God. Well, the truth is you can't fail God. It's only yourself you can fail. God is too big for failure to be associated with him. But we, we can't fail ourselves. We only have a short time here. Future generations will not curse us in the name of Jesus. They won't say this was brought to pass and we didn't do anything about it. Or we stand united. And, and that's one of the pluses. You know, that's one of the pluses of all of this. Now, different people, different um, missions and, and, and denominations are coming together because we have a common goal. Uh, like I said yesterday, we dropped the ball in the past, but we're not dropping any more balls in the name of Jesus. Now we stand together, we stand strong, and we fight this thing. We, we need to make sure our children are not indoctrinated in strange ways. We need to make them understand that even though we, we're taking a stand, pulling them out of certain classes, the Muslim feel bad. And my personal prayer is that their, 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 their pairs won't put them under pressure to be like them. You know, there are things beyond our control, but um, nothing is beyond God's control. Um, I was talking to my brother, my friend yesterday, Pastor Valeria, and um, their church is doing what I think is one of the ways forward. Because, you know, like I said yesterday, the Bible makes it clear for us Christians, the kingdom of God is not in word, it's in power. And that means we're not just going to gather and have meeting after meeting. We're going to gather and we're going to share what God is showing us to do. Because it's about action. It's not about words. The kingdom is not in words, it's in power. And one of the things they are doing um, to fight this is they've started a Christian school. They started a few days ago. <laughs> Glory to God. They started a Christian school. And I asked him a question or two and he enlightened me. He said, as long as you're not taking grants from the government, they have nothing to do with your curriculum. So they have a school by God's grace that God is funding, not the government. So they're not compelled to bow to man. They're not compelled to bow to the system. Uh, they're, they're, the, the school is completely kingdom. And that's what we have to do. Let's start believing God for the finances. Let's start praying for the finances. Let's build as, as many schools as the Lord will allow us to build. And then that way we don't have to fight the system. We will pray for the system and send our children to Christian schools in the name of Jesus. So that, that, that reduces the battle. Plenty more can be said, but I'll stop um, with one last point. We also need to get into politics. We need to get into politics because we need, you see, you can't fight a people that are making decisions from the outside. Like this, and like Teresa said, they said a survey was done. No, I haven't seen a single person that was part of that survey. I haven't seen a single person that knew about the survey. I haven't seen a single person that was contacted um, as part of the survey. So when you're on the outside, they can tell you things that are fierce. But when you're on the inside, then you can stand up and the fight is stronger. So I completely believe a lot of us need to get involved with politics and God will help us. So three things, train up the child. One, two, the school system. Let's build something alongside, something that will edify our children, something that will help them stand in good stead in the future. And finally, let's get involved in politics. We're going to hear a lot more by God's grace. But permit me to read one last scripture. The word of God says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. God help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. A big thank you to Pastor uh, Tunde for that. It's great to have you here this evening and to, to hear him speak uh, from the redeemed churches. 
Uh, so our next speaker um, is a journalist who's not afraid to ask the difficult questions and to report on the stories that many uh, media houses are not reporting on. So uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Ben Scanlon to the stage. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you so very much for inviting me to speak about this hugely important subject. I, I actually think there are very few things more important than this issue in our modern era. And honestly, people like yourselves taking the time out of your busy schedules to come here and discuss this matter is not only admirable, but it's courageous to do in our current cultural climate. And so I would invite you to have a round of applause for your neighbor for having the moral courage to be here tonight and to discuss this. You know, I think this is an issue that it hits closer to home for me personally as of late because my wife and I are expecting our first baby in about six weeks' time, a little boy. And actually, I should probably correct myself because I say my wife and I are expecting, but looking at the 3D scans of this baby, she's not actually convinced that she contributed any DNA at all. She's, she says she's totally identical to me, so he may just be a clone of some kind, but... Either way, the point is, when you have actual skin in the game and a child of your own, these issues feel different, don't they? I think that this isn't just another political issue anymore like taxation policy or infrastructure projects. This is about your baby boy or your baby girl and their innocence. And we all know that as a parent, that's more precious to you than gold. And that's why this issue is such a line in the sand for so many otherwise meek and non-confrontational people. That's why it's so emotive. And you know, very briefly, before I get into the issue in hand, at hand in any kind of detail, I think it's worth noting that when it comes to subjects that pertain to the family unit, it's no surprise that you typically find a disproportionate number of Christians at the forefront of those debates. And of course, there are many non-Christians who also feel strongly about these issues. You don't have to be Christian or even religious to take an interest in what your child is learning, obviously. But Christians tend to play a significant role in debates that impact on the family. And I think that's because the story of Christianity's central figure begins with a child and his parents. Many other religions through history were centered around the campaigns of generals or kings or adult princes, but the Christian story begins with a poor mother named Mary and a humble father named Joseph cradling their beloved newborn son in a stable. They were a family with no wealth to speak of except the wealth which truly matters, which is the mutual love between them. And so from that day to this, for thousands of years now, Christians have loved the family and fought unceasingly to protect and preserve it. And I don't think that's a coincidence. So who else would you expect to find at the front lines of these issues but people of that faith? So that's why this subject matters to me, and that's why it matters to you, presumably. And so what is the problem exactly with Ireland's proposed SPHE curriculum? What is all the fuss about here? Well, fundamentally, it comes down to whether we want our children to be informed and taught things that are true or deceived and taught things that are false. That is the question facing us at its most basic level. Because when you have the government's official national curriculum body encouraging the teaching of gender ideology and so on at schools as if it was objective fa fact, that is false. It's not a fact that people can be biologically born as a male, but then later become female or vice versa. That is an opinion which is held by certain people in society, and dare I say it, it's an incoherent opinion. It's, opinion. it's an opinion that doesn't make sense, although people are, of course, welcome to it. Because in this world, there are all sorts of strange beliefs and opinions about all sorts of subjects. There are people who believe in astrology and zodiac star signs who follow that religiously. There are people who believe in ghosts. There are people who believe in the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot or that Elvis is still alive hanging out in the Bahamas somewhere. <laughs> and those people are perfectly entitled to believe whatever they want. We live in a free world where we all have free will as human beings. But what you're not entitled to do is teach these things to my children from a position of authority as if it's a fact, because it's not. Because it's not a fact, it's an ideology. And you cannot and will not teach your incoherent ideology in the classroom to my young children who aren't mentally equipped to deal with it. It really is that simple. <laughs> Thank you. 
And especially not, by the way, when you go beyond the basic tenets of gender ideology and you start delving into identities like non-binary, the idea that you can be neither a male nor female, but a third unspecified gender entirely. In fact, uh, some of you may have seen a clip from last year where the then leader of the Shannad, Fine Gael Senator Regina Doherty, told the Scottish Parliament that there are about nine genders. So about nine, it could be eight, it could be 10. It's kind of a rough ballpark figure. And when I asked uh, Tisha Gliovaradkar, what is the government's position on how many genders there are? He said that they have no official position on that. So the, the jury is still out. So this is, this is what we're dealing with, or even stranger still, the idea of somebody being gender fluid, which is the notion that you can be a man one day and a woman the next day and switch back and forth between them depending on the mood or the hour. So I could potentially start this speech as Ben and then finish it as Brenda, and everyone here has to respect that apparently. So this is not credible. It's not science, it's a view held by some radical ideologues with fringe beliefs, and it has no place in any school curriculum, so far as I'm concerned. Because these ideas are not without their consequence either. We all know what it's like to be a child or a teenager, and we know what it's like to be insecure about your place in the world and in life, to feel like you don't quite fit in as a young adolescent. And so imagine if you have an authority figure that you respect in your life, like a teacher, saying that one reason sometimes people feel uncomfortable and out of place in their body is because they're actually another gender. What do we think is going to happen when we say that to young people? Well, of course, there's going to be a certain amount of vulnerable and confused children who have that idea artificially introduced to their thinking, and that can irreversibly change the trajectory of their life forever, and not for the better, I might add. Just earlier this year, uh, I published an article outlining how in 2021, the Irish government was aware that the evidence around the long-term effects of puberty blockers on children was, quote, very scarce, and that the impact was, quote, largely unknown, even as the government was sending children to receive these treatments. In the piece of research which was published by the Irish government, this report acknowledged that there was a potential that these treatments could negatively impact bone density, cognitive development, fertility, and more. So the government's own published research conducted by NUIG admits that they know very little about the potential health impacts of these gender hormone treatments. And when I asked the Minister for Children, Roger Gorman, about this at a press event, he said that he didn't dispute the findings of the research. And yet, at the same time, we want to teach children about an ideology which often leads down this path. It often leads to treatments which the government freely admits are potentially risky and experimental. How is that responsible? How can anyone with a shred of common sense or a conscience stand over this? <laughs> but that's not the only thing that's causing consternation about the curriculum, because we also have proposals from state teaching authorities which would urge students to recognize their privileged status as a white person, a male, or an Irish person. So in other words, we're now supposed to explicitly encourage children to judge themselves and one another on the basis of nationality and skin color. Now maybe it's just me, but I was under the impression that generations of good parents had spent endless hours trying to steer their children away from racial thinking and towards universal respect and fraternity. Good parents don't raise their children to have a victim mentality or to judge other people on the basis of their genetics, right? And so, apparently, that's exactly what children are supposed to be taught at schools. What a regressive and terrible thing to teach a child. What could be more corrosive to our social fabric than this? And mind you, when concerned parents complain about all of this, what is the response? Well, politicians tell us that this is a so-called culture war that's being waged. And indeed, they're right. There is a culture war being waged. It's being waged by the politicians, quite frankly, because parents... Because parents were minding their own business for years, they were perfectly happy sending their children to school to learn about maths and history and world languages and geography and science, and no one had a problem with any of this. 
But into this peace, the politicians are the ones who took it upon themselves to take controversial, unproven political ideology, largely imported from America, and insert it into the classroom where it never was before. And then when parents complain about this, they call it a war. You know what I call it? Inevitable. Of course people were going to have a problem with this and object to it. Of course there was going to be blowback. There is nothing that parents value more than their children and their children's values. Other people's children are not the political pawns of a radical fringe activist with, a, with an agenda, and they never will be, quite frankly. So if this is a culture war, it's a war of their own making, because no one asked for this, no one was consulted about this, and nobody should have to accept this against their will. Because I don't want to live in a society where vulnerable children are being deliberately confused about their fundamental identity. I don't want to live in a country where people are judging each other and looking down on each other along racial lines. That's not a country I recognize, and it's not a country that I will accept for my child, and I hope that you feel the same way. God bless and Aaron Gabrath. Hello. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Ben Scanlon. Um, and it's a great uh, privilege to have uh, Senator Sharon Keoghan here today, somebody who is in government, who has that position of influence and is willing to speak up on these issues uh, and to be a voice. So we're very grateful to welcome you here this evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's such a pleasure to be here tonight, and I thank Pastor John and all the good people in Christian Voice Ireland for making this night happen. It's so important that events like this do happen, and I know that we're going to be able to make a difference in people's lives here tonight. My name is Senator Sharon Keoghan. I'm an independent senator in Shannadairn since 2020, and since my election, I've been using my position as an independent with no affiliation with any political party to raise the issues that other politicians wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. Because if they t spoke the truth about it, there'd be a pile on on Twitter and their party would drop them faster than they could say cancel culture. In the Senate chamber, I speak out about the impacts of the scourge of abortion on the pre-born children and women of Ireland, the culture, cultural attacks on the marital family, and more and more lately, and increasingly persuasive, state-sponsored gender confusion about, uh, that's foisted on our children. As I prepared for this evening, I was reminded of a story I heard before about two builders, one old and experienced, and the young one, and he was only newly trained. As they were walking through the centre of an old European city, the younger builder points to the huge, magnificent cathedral whose shadows they were walking in and asks the older builder, why don't we build anything like that anymore? The older builder thinks for a moment before turning and saying, to build a cathedral, you need conviction. And nowadays, everyone only has opinions. It certainly feels that way in Leinster House, where most politicians aren't leaders at all, but instead are slaves to popularity, to trends, and to the modern progressive zygists. They operate their flags like flags going any way the wind blows, and their opinions are always those that they think will be most beneficial to them. While there are still some good men and women in Dáil Éireann and the Shannon, I know Deputy uh, Pather Tobin spoke here in July, it can often feel, for those still speaking the truth, that their voices are crying out in the wilderness. And so it is very nice to be in a room full of people with conviction here tonight. All of us... All of us are here because we have conviction. We are convicted by our faith, by our beliefs, our beliefs about family, about men and women, and about our children. We see what is happening in the world, the intentional eroding of parental rights, the ideological capturing 
of our government and the institution by radical activists and the indoctrination of our children into the cult of gender ideology. I'm aware that I'm sharing the stage with two pastors, so I'm not going to try and delve into biblical sexuality and the theory of the body, but I can explain a bit of what is happening in our schools and share my thoughts as to why this is happening, as well as what we should be doing in response. The official school curriculum for primary and secondary education in Ireland is set by the Minister of Education, currently Deputy Normal Foley, who is heavily influenced by a body called the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment, which is a statutory body of the Department of Education. In May of this year, the NCCA published the updated Social, Personal and Health Education, the SPHE curriculum for junior cycle students, for students from first year to third year, age 12 to 15 and 16. While some observers and commentators had made foreboding predictions as to what content would be produced by the NCCA, many parents were completely blindsided by the level of purely ideological content being presented as undisputed truth the graphic nature of some of the content and the teaching of topics which are completely age inappropriate. Under the guidelines, children as young as 12 will be discussing online porn, the ins and outs of consent in sexual relationships, their own so-called gender identity and that of others as well as their sexual orientation. Topics covered will include consent, intimacy and mutual pleasure, and how to spot the signs of abusive and violent relationships. Pupils will also learn about responses to unplanned pregnancies and accessing health sexual services. So in the eyes of the government, our 12-year-olds must know how to get an abortion if they get pregnant. Children would also be taught how harmful attitudes about gender are perpetuated in the media online and in society, and how to confront this. What harmful attitudes are being referred to? We can only guess that they mean offensive, outdated statements such as, men are men and women are women, and one cannot become the other, or men and women are different, or even only men, only women, only women can give birth and be mothers. Under the new NCCA curriculum, your children will be taught to confront such ideas. Their teachers will equip them with talking points to debate and to refute any such assertions that may be made to them by anyone, even by you. Public schools are now inoculating children against Christian teaching. It is stated in the early, in the early learning outcomes for junior cycle students, that students should appreciate that sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression are core parts of human identity, and that each are experienced alongside a spectrum, and that a child can be a boy, girl, neither, or both, irrespective of the sex they were assigned at birth. Children will be asked to make presentations and describe how they can be supported to trans-identify individuals and how to give advice for how people can support those treated unfairly because of the way they express their gender. In none of this content is it mentioned at all of this radical teaching is less than 30 years old, that the foundation ideology of it is, is a shocking recent modern invention, the long-term impact of which can only be guessed at. And in none of this, this teaching is there any debate encouraged or even allowed. Quite the opposite. Children are taught how to teach and defend trans ideology using material generated by LGBTQIA advocacy groups like Tenney, 
belong to and Glen, all with the view of normalizing this particular worldview and indeed presenting it as the only socially acceptable view to hold. Support for this view is referred to with words like diversity and inclusion, while opposition, opposition to it is referred to with such terms as bullying and hatred. And we're seeing the fruits of this already. Multiple teenagers from across the country have gone public with their experience of ostracization and bullying on account of being transphobic and their defense of biological truth and transitional and traditional values. The acceptance of diversity preached by the gender cult does not extend to them. The progressives will only accept diversity of gender and sexual orientation. When it comes to thought, only sanctioned thoughts are acceptable, and these are policed relentlessly. You may be uh, taking this all in and thinking, how did we get here? Now, to answer the question fully, would we'll take up the rest of the evening and then some. If you really want to go back to the roots of it, you can investigate the figures of Alfred Kingsley and John Money. But the long and short of it is that there are three groups that have made or allow this to happen. The first group are the radical activist ideologues in positions of power in the state who are actively pursuing this agenda. The second group are the run-of-the-mill politicians who do the bidding of those who shout the loudest as they want to be popular and get re-elected. And three, those who disagree with the first two but are too scared to say anything in case they lose their jobs. The first group is the smallest, the people who are full converts to the cult of gender, are small in number, but they have outsized influence on account of occupying high political office and senior civil servant positions. Using their positions, they can channel money into radical NGOs such as Tenny, Belong To, Glen. This allows these NGOs to become the loudest voice in the room and spread their message to the second group, who accept the narrative and follow along. Finally, the repeated messaging of the first two groups that anyone who, who opposes them or disagrees is backward, hateful, bigoted and even evil causes the third group to keep their dissent to themselves and their heads below the parapet so as not to cause harm to themselves or their families. As Deputy Tobin said in July, the mainstream media is creating a scenario where people are led to feel that they are the minority with their opposition to gender ideology being taught to children, when in fact, he said, this is the view held by the majority. Most polling, that's been done has shown that the majority of parents think it's wrong that children in primary schools are being taught about transgenderism. The kicker is the size of the third group is vastly larger than any of the other two groups combined. The radical activists know that they cannot win against the majority who disagree with them. So they make every attempt to project their propaganda at the third group, saying, you are not the minority. Everyone is on our side. If you stand up, you will be alone and you, we will crush you. Our victory is a foregone conclusion, except that you have lost and move on. It is in the rejection of this lie that must be the crux of our response to this madness. The only thing necessary for triumph of evil is for good men and women to do nothing. All of you have taken a huge step in the fight by coming here tonight and equipping yourself with this information. The belt of truth buckled around your waist. Now we must take action. Removing or limiting the second category of persons is key. We must alert the politicians that this is an issue that will affect them where it hurts, at elections. Write to your local politicians and express your concerns. Call them. Go to their constituency clinics. Make sure they know that they will never get a single vote from you if they do not speak up and speak out against the radical gender ideology that has been marched into our schools. 
go to parentsrightalliance.com where they have letters, templates, to request that your child be removed from RSE, SP, HE classes and send them to your school principal. Sufficient volume of these across the country will raise flags and generate important discussions. In fact, it was brought to my attention that the Education Act of 1998, Section 9D, states that the school shall provide education to students which promotes the moral, spiritual, social and personal development of students and provide health education for them in consultation with their parents and having regard to the characteristic spirit of the school. This means that you, as a parent, are entitled to be consulted by your child's school when it comes to their moral and health education being provided there. You can write to the principal of the parents' council and ask that a consultation take place where you can make your voice heard. If the school do not properly consult with the parents, they are breaking the law. Remind them of that. And finally, perhaps most importantly, let other par parents know. Talk to people and tell them what you have learned here tonight. Get educated, get informed and share your knowledge and that the truth of what is going on with other people. Many, many people out there simply do not know what is happening. So we have to get the word out there. Get everyone informed so that we can gather political momentum and critical mass. I've seen it in action in Leinster House. The political class can ignore a lot when it suits them. But there certainly is a limit to it. Eventually, they have to take notice. That's what we have to do now. We go out there, we make ourselves heard. This is not a lost battle. We have the majority. We have the conviction. And we have the truth. Yeah. Down. <laughs> Down with the evil and up with the right. Ours is the victory. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Keoghan, for that very illuminating uh, talk. Uh, the final speaker requires no introduction. He's worked tirelessly to unite uh, Christian leaders in this nation and to fight for religious freedoms. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Pastor John to the stage. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much to those of you who made the effort to come out. Uh, to those of you staying at home watching TV, I love you, but you're not helping. I want to start with a quote. Again, thank you so much to all of our speakers. I so appreciate you coming tonight. Could you show appreciation to every one of them again? Pope John Paul II. As the family goes, so goes the nation, and so goes the whole world in which we live. John Wesley, the history of mankind, the history of salvation, passes by way of the family. My mother was the source from whom I gained the guiding principles of my life. And again, I learned more Christianity from my mother than from all the theologians in England. Family is a sacred God-ordained institution. Family is everything. The 1916 proclamation of the Irish Republic resolved to cherish all the children 
of the nation equally. And surely part of cherishing children is protecting children. In particular, protecting their innocence and emerging identity from those who would sow confusion and perversion in their hearts. Don't use that word, Pastor. You will alienate people. Sorry, but teaching little kids about masturbation and anal sex isn't appropriate, it's perverted, and I'm not going to apologize. The UN and the WAF, the WEF, are utterly wrong when they say that kids are sexual beings. And it's interesting, if you look into some of their writings on these issues, it's, it's absolutely shocking. And it seems clear there's a demonic agenda to sexualize children in the name of education. I disagree with the Taoiseach. Some of the books being put, into, uh, being put in place in libraries are not just simply inappropriate, they're perverted. And no child should be exposed to them. I know Senator Sharon read some of them um, in the Senate. But as parents, you have a God-given instinct to protect your kids from dangerous people and dangerous ideas because there are some subjects that kids are not yet ready to hear. And I want to read a quote here by uh, Cory ten Boom. She was a Dutch Christian who, along with her family, were imprisoned in um, Ravensbrück concentration camp uh, because they had helped uh, many Jewish families escape the Nazis. And hear this quote, she said, and so seated next to my father in the train compartment, I suddenly asked, Father, what is sex in? He turned to look at me as he always did when answering a question, but to my surprise said nothing. At last he stood up, lifted his traveling case off the floor and set it on the floor. Uh, set it, uh, yeah, and, and set the, this heavy case on the floor. Will you carry it off the train, Corey, he asked. I stood up and tugged at it. It was crammed with the watches and spare parts he had purchased that morning, for he was a watchmaker. It's too heavy, I said. Yes, he said. And I would be a pretty poor father who would ask his little child to carry such a load. It's the same way, Corey, with knowledge. Some knowledge is too heavy for children. When you are older and stronger, you can bear it. For now, you must trust me to carry it for you. And in the same way, it's clear that, that kids develop at different stages and degrees. There, there is no one size fits all uh, regarding a child's development. You see, nobody knows their children better than their parents. And, you know, Article 42, 1 from the Constitution says, the state acknowledges that the primary and natural educator of the child is the family and guarantees to respect the inalienable rights and duty of parents to provide according to their means for the religious and moral, intellectual, physical and social education of their children. And two, parents shall be free to provide this education in their homes or private schools or schools recognized or established by the state. You see, family is everything and education is a key part, a key aspect to the preservation and prosperity of family. SPHE at its core is anti-family for it presents family as simply just another community among others. But the founders of the Irish state believed in family and thus it was acknowledged in our founding documents because it was implicitly understood by them that family and by extension parenthood was worth protecting and had to be protected if our society was to have any future. And thus, these recent changes to the education system, in a way, are a logical outworking of the nihilistic, anti-family, anti-gender, and ultimately anti-human view that many of our world leaders have embraced. And this explains the relentless push of climate change, this idea that the world is in danger, ironically, because of the prevalence of human life, which is viewed as a form of pollution. And, and a real and present danger uh, and threat to the planet. And thus, you must not only control consumption, uh, you ultimately have to control and reduce the population. And thus, abortion, euthanasia, and trans indoctrination of impressionable children all work hand in glove to deface, devalue, and uh, ultimately destroy human life made in God's, in God's image. You see, 
Imago Dei is uh, uh, Latin for image of God. And, and let me say this, this social engineering has to stop because incidentally, many of our leaders are childless, including our Taoiseach, Minister for Education, and Minister for Children, along with many global leaders. And this isn't an accusation, it's simply an observation. And thus, they don't always understand what is at stake because parenthood changes us radically. Many of us saw the world very differently before we had children. I'm, I'm reminded of that funny scene from Paddington Bear where, you know, he, uh, the father drives up with his pregnant wife on a motorbike and he's got, you know, long hair and he's uh, dressed like a hippie. And um, a couple of days later, he comes back to collect the child and he's, now he's dressed like an older man. He's driving a beige Volvo. And... Um, it was just that, that, that realization that, you know, becoming fathers changes us. And, and again, you maybe say, Pastor, are you daring to say that someone shouldn't be minister for education or minister for children unless they have kids themselves? Yes. Why should you? Why should you be entrusted with making policies that affect kids and you don't have any? If you're not a father or mother, you cannot understand the sacred bond that you have with your child. Because if, if Genesis 1:27, uh, God made the male and female, gives us the archetype, our, our blueprint for gender, Genesis 2:20 to 25 gives us the blueprint for family. This reason, a man shall leave his father and mother. This is the very, very beginning of the Bible, and leave uh, and it says, uh, "Be joined to his wife; they two shall become one flesh." And so. But this is the problem. As a society, we have redefined marriage and family, and now we want to redefine sex and gender. They redefine because they want to undermine. Because family is the last defense against these anti-God, anti-human policies. Because the social engineering project will not be finished until everything that God has given to man has been literally destroyed beyond recognition. Imago Dei, the image of God in man, is reflected in our gender. Male and female, as defined by God, and this culminates in marriage, and, and hopefully uh, uh, afterwards with children. And, and we see this sense of completion, two halves um, uh, being miraculously joined together by God, different but equal, different by divine design, equal in, in, uh, equal in value, but different in ability. A, a woman can't father a child, and a man can't get pregnant. I mean, these shouldn't be controversial statements. And our reluctance to say this openly is an indication of just how deluded and disconnected from reality we have become. Because our society's deliberate and obsessive efforts to eliminate words like father and mother and instead use parent one and two on our official documents and thereby pretending uh, that any two random people can somehow create life. They can't. You need a male, you need a female. Um, <laughs> or a rapacing, uh, uh, you know, woman with people who menstruate, uh, replacing breastfeeding with chest feeding, and teachers being advised to stop using archaic terms like boys and girls, and, and giving their pronouns. I believe that's a warning to us because all of this is a statement of intent. The war on words and the redefinition of age-old meaning is a declaration that they intend to destroy not just the word or the meaning, but the very concept of itself, uh, whether of gender, sex, morality, and by extension, the family units. So don't be naive. They're deliberately undermining parental authority and the very family itself by teaching these radical and unbiological ideas of sexuality. And let me say this, I find it hard to respect religious leaders who know better because we've been given the manual that clearly identifies the God-given uh, uh, distinctions that exist between the sexes. And let me say this again, I have friends that I've known for 15, 20 years in ministry. They're not here, they weren't here the last time, and they believe what I believe, but they are hiding and they refuse. The, the problem they have is because I say openly what they believe in private. If you are a if you're a pastor, if you're a priest, if you're a bishop, if you're an imam, this is a time to stand up and be counted. Ask your pastor, were you here? 
And if not, why not? What were you doing? Watching Coronation Street? (laughs) Sorry, I'm not good at political correctness. I burned a lot of bridges. But sometimes bridges need to be burned. Sometimes things need to be said. Sometimes a line has to be drawn. This is not a day to be a spineless coward. We are different by design. And for those men and women who remain silent in the face of the war on family, gender, kids, and life itself, let me simply quote the British writer C.S. Lewis, who said, one of the most cowardly things ordinary people do is to shut their eyes to facts. Facts are stubborn things. They don't change. Even when we change the meaning of words, Or when we just choose to look the other way and pretend we did not see. I can pretend that gravity doesn't exist, but if I jump off the roof of this building in a Superman costume, guess what will happen? Even if I'm delusional, my delusion does not change reality. I may be hurt or even killed. And in the same way, children who are taught this delusional ideology will suffer harm because biological fact cannot be erased by drugs, medical procedures, or state-sponsored propaganda. Feelings cannot erase or override facts. And the fact is, sex is binary and gender is unchangeable. And yet, tragically, For the kids who've been brainwashed by our education system, it will be too late if they have been sterilized and mutilated because there is no coming back. And the fact is this, children are being indoctrinated in Irish schools with information that is not biologically correct, rational, nor safe. And the relentless and obsessive pushing of LGBT material in our schools is not respectful, nor is it inclusive to people of faith. And if that offends you, be offended. Because for far too long, Christian kids have felt like they have been under assault and intimidated and we have been silent and I'm sure there are many Muslim and Jewish kids who feel the exact same way. It's time to be frank. Live your life. But leave our kids alone. Because whether you can see it or not, the trans movement is simply the logical progression of LGP, LGB. And, and to act like it isn't is utterly disingenuous. This is how we got here. We've exalted rights over responsibilities, self-indulgence over self-restraint, rebellion over submission, lies over truth, and man over God. And then we wonder why we're in the mess that we are in. You know, The Sound of Freedom was in Irish cinemas recently, a powerful movie exposing the evils of child trafficking. You know, the movie, in essence, is about predators who seek to sexualize, use, and abuse children. Don't go there, pastor. Don't use the P word. Listen, I'm not, a, I'm not worried if I offend predators, okay? Because I have no problem. Live as you want. But if your goal is to speak to little children about sex and dance before them, dressed like a stripper, I'm sorry, you're a predator. Why not go into the prisons and dance for them? Why not go into old folks' homes? See how that goes. One of the most cowardly things ordinary people do is to shut their eyes to facts. You see, many of my friends say, I'm just called to preach the gospel. I'm not called to confront worldly governments. And so you sit back and allow kids to be confused, sexualized, and taken on a pathway to hell. Do you think as a religious leader that that you have a duty of care to protect children? Do you think Jesus would have been silent? Was he silent when they were buying and selling in the temple? 
Surely, as, he follow, as his followers, he wants us to do more than simply pray and hope for the best. I mean, did Martin Luther King do that? Did William Wilberforce do that? No. They, they did more than that. They recognized that, that we don't, you know, I, I, I exist in, in a little bubble. We, 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 we have to understand, uh, you know, we, we have a responsibility to our, our society to make it a better place. And, you know, Jesus had very strong opinions about those who hurt kids. Matthew 18 and 6, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, do you think that teaching little kids, you know, five and ten year old kids about anal sex and about oral sex and about uh, all of these, uh, you know, sexual things, do you, do you think that might harm them? Do you think it might put them on a, on a pathway maybe that they might never have, have been on? Let me say this, as a, as a, as a probably an eight-year-old boy, I, I was an avid reader. I remember in my, in my grandmother's house, there was a little storybook I read. And um, in this storybook, it was just an adventure about this boy, you know, and it, it was one a really interesting story. I was enthralled, but, uh, you know, towards the end of the story, um, somebody wrote that with a, a very deviant mind because at the end, the, the boy was, a spell was broken and he turned into this beautiful little girl. And you know what, That's, that just, one book sowed confusion in my heart for probably three or four years where I started wondering, maybe was I meant to be that way as well? Because kids are impressionable. They're open to suggestion. That was, that was always understood by parents. You know, the, there's, I think it was G.K. Ch Chesterton once, once said, you know, don't be so open-minded that your brains fall out. I think that pretty much describes our generation. And so, anyway, um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he said this, the ultimate test of a moral society is the kind of world that, leads to its, that it leaves to its children. You know, I have, a, I, have a, I have a profound sense of gratitude to these men who, who laid their lives down in World War II to, to, to purchase a freedom that they would never enjoy themselves. A freedom that I enjoyed. And, and amazingly, long before I was born, they were fighting for me. Many of these men, uh, you know, Canadian, American, British, uh, Polish, uh, French, etc. Some of them 18, 19, 20 years of age, giving their lives so that we could enjoy freedom. Well, I believe it's time for us to pay it forward to the next generation. And that's why we have to stand. We have to stand. There's a time to be silent. There's a time to speak. And I say that to all of my colleagues in ministry. Guys, it's time to grow a pair and, and either step forward or step aside. If we remain silent, particularly as religious leaders, we are doing our kids, our congregation, and our society a disservice. You might say, well, what about showing compassion to kids that are confused? Well, putting those poor kids on puberty blockers, mutilating, mutilating and sterilizing them is not compassion. You see, we have redefined the family and thus rejected God's order. You know, the Barbie movie is a perfect example of the cynical social engineering that is happening right under our noses. Are you aware of the messaging they've been putting into children's entertainment for some years now? You see, the idea of family is forever has been replaced by the mantra, inclusion is everything. And so we see cartoons like Disney Muppet Babies with Gonzo cross-dressing or books like Pink is for Boys by Rob Perlman described in one review as this celebration uh, of the colors of the rainbow featuring a div diverse cast of characters encourages kids to, be, to reject rigid gender norms and to follow their passions. It's for ages four to eight. You know, to, to reject rigid gender norms? I mean, what kid even understands what they're even saying there? As people in, of faith, we believe in truth that is not determined by culture, courts, social media, but by God. Amen. Transcendent truth. You might say, but Pastor Bar Barbie's just a bit of harmless fun. Don't be such a dummy. It's brainwashing. It's propaganda. 2 Corinthians 11, it says, And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's no surprise then if his servants masquerade as angels of righteousness. You see, evil masquerades as good. Darkness masquerades as light. Lies masquerade as truth. And indoctrination masquerades as education. You know, the Bible spoke about times like this. It says, justice is turned back and righteousness stands afar off, for truth is fallen in the streets. 
And this is the reality. We have activists masquerading as politicians, teachers, and journalists. And so too, we have lies and propaganda masquerading as education and entertainment. And thus, we have woke world, where literally everything, and I mean everything, is a lesson. Barbie's just another piece of woke poison being fed to our kids. You know, all of us like a little nostalgia, and many mothers may enjoy it in the level of reliving their childhood, but not realize it's just another anti-man, anti-mother, anti-family diatribe being planted in the hearts of little kids. You see, this agenda isn't just to erase women, it is about erasing mothers, fathers, and in particular, family. You see, a girl or a boy who goes down the trans rabbit hole ends up being sterilized. And ultimately, I believe this is the end goal of those who are promoting this agenda of less useless eaters. Or as the Greens or Stop Oil cult members might say, less people, less pollution. <laughs> Amen Ryan is free to use that for his next election. <laughs> less people, less pollution. Forget about the euphemisms about concern, compassion, or inclusion. They are lies. We are being lied to all the time. Abortion isn't about health care. It is the brutal murder of an innocent life. In the same way, trans ideology is neither compassionate, progressive, nor inclusive. It might be dressed up in the language of compassion, but in reality, it's divisive, destructive, dangerous, and utterly unscientific, and it has to be removed from our schools. And let me say this. If you've never heard a minister or a priest or a religious leader talking like this, you're going to the wrong church. Because if your pastor, priest, or bishop isn't addressing these issues and taking a public stand, and in particular, a stand on, beh on behalf of the war of the on the family, they're, they're either asleep or they're cowards. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to be disrespectful. I'm just being honest. Because I've had it up to here with people giving me their little excuses. Oh, I have to be here. I have to be there. I have to do the other thing. No, this is about our children. This is about our children. I, I, I'll come if I find time. No, you don't find time. You make time for what is important. This is important. Martin Luther King spoke to the conscience of a nation. That was his job and it ultimately cost him his life. But he was faithful to speak truth to power and proclaimed truth. And he helped to shape his nation for the better. And so our silence as ministers on the trans issue has not helped. As religious leaders, we have a duty of care to our children. Ask your pastor or priest why they're not speaking on this issue. There's a time for us, to, like I said, to count the cost and realize there may be a price to pay for standing up for truth, but let's ensure that we pay it and not our children or our children's children who might not even actually exist if they end up being brainwashed and consequently confused and subsequently sterilized. You see, there are some I believe for whom ministry is a career, not a calling, and thus they are able to remain silent to avoid being attacked or losing members. Well, pastor, maybe they're speaking quietly in the background to avoid confrontation or public embarrassment to the government. Well, let me say this, it's not working. Yeah. They implemented this. It's in our schools. Yeah. Okay, they've shown us, as people of faith, no respect. And again, to our Muslim friends, you are welcome. I am so appreciate you coming here. Thank you. Our government have sent kids to Tavistock Clinic in the UK. Kids have been prescribed life-altering puberty blockers and this curriculum or program is endorsing and fast-tracking this toxic gender ideology in our schools. I appreciate Irish government are hoping that we will give, give up and go away, but they need to realize something. We are not giving up on our children or the children of this nation to a destructive, unscientific policy that will not only cause confusion, but violate the innocence of children and sexualize them long before any such natural inclination would exist. And now, I appreciate to some of the blue-haired, childless, vegan, cat-keeping activists and ideologues behind these policies, these changes might make perfect sense. But to us who are parents and have a vested interest in protecting the innocence of our children, this is not acceptable and we will not go away. We are the parents of our children. 
not the state. And I will keep repeating that word, parents and family, because it's like garlic and a cross to the vampirish tendencies of those who wish to indoctrinate, sexualize, and ultimately confuse our children in the name of progress. I said it the last time, but again, if an adult feels the need to talk to kids about sex, then they're the problem, they're the bad guy. Get the hell away from our kids. Give me, just give me two or three minutes and I'll finish. The, the US President Joe Biden is wrong. Children are not the property of the state. Last April he asserted, our nation's children are all our children. No, they are not. Children are neither produced by nor the property of governments, NGOs, or global corporations, and governments need to stop this relentless and obsessing, uh, obsessive undermining of the family unit. Family is forever. And any state that does not protect the family is destined to fail. Family is everything. They are our children. They do not belong to politicians, teachers, or activists. And as people of faith, or simply people of common sense, we need to realize and openly state that gender ideology is destructive, divisive, and ultimately a Trojan horse to facilitate the weaponization of our education system against faith, family, and the age-old understanding of our God-given distinctions between male and female. And so, again, as I finish, I just want to acknowledge this. You know, 2 Kings gives a story of King Hezekiah and it says he was sick and he cried out to God and God gave him an extra 15 years. However, the kings of uh, uh, Babylon came. He showed them the temple. He showed them all everything and the, the prophet came and rebuked him and he said uh, something quite, uh, quite profound. He said, uh, he, he rebuked him f uh, for, for doing this and um, it, it, it's Second Kings chapter 20, and I, I just think it's very relevant to the times that we are in. You know, Jesus said this, count the cost. And he said, behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons um, who will descend from you. Whom you, will, they will, um, whom you will beget, and they will be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And so Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which you've spoken is good, for he said, will there not be peace and truth at least in my days? Like this king, it's easy for us to be selfish, narcissistic, and lazy. This place could have been filled tonight, unless, except that people are selfish, narcissistic, and ultimately lazy. And so we choose the easy way. And we avoid the battles that our kids will one day have to fight. Hezekiah chose the quiet life. He gave up on the next generation. I mean, when he was sick, he cried out for his own life, but he wasn't burdened or concerned about the generations that were to come. Are you? Are you concerned about the Ireland that we will see in 10, 20, 30 years time? When, when grown adults are afraid to give their opinion about what they think. And this hasn't happened overnight. I mean, it, we've seen it now with quite a few years, whether it was the same-sex marriage referendum or uh, abortion or any of these, these issues where, where now there's only one right opinion and, and if you don't buy into it, then you are excluded from polite society and you're treated like you're some kind of pariah. The reason why I'm dangerous is because I no longer care what people say or think or do. I'm speaking up because I have a burden for the children of this nation. We're going to go into Q&A in a moment and it's on the screen there. You can start putting in your questions. But I'm speaking up because I have a burden for the children of this nation who will suffer once again because of cowardice and state ineptitude, because we are seeing a, cre a, a creeping erosion of our rights and freedoms as parents and people of faith. Ironically, in the name of giving rights and freedoms to others. But a child's right to his or her God-given identity and innocence, and the right to an education free from Marxist indoctrination, and the teaching of unscientific nonsense. You know, a woman's right to privacy, i.e. toilets and changing rooms, these are non-negotiables. 
Healthy societies have always had healthy boundaries and our inability or unwillingness to fight for them is a disturbing indication of our cowardice, our apathy, and our stupidity. I've come to the conclusion this is one of the defining issues of our age and that's why I've put everything on the altar with regards to this. I'm going to let the chips fall where they may. But I knew I needed to take this stand tonight and say what needed to be said. This is our World War II moment. I'm not being melodramatic. But again, this is about the indoctrination of our children. And again, you need to ask your minister, priest, bishop, imam, whatever. What do you believe regarding gender ideology? And if you don't support it, what are you doing to stop it? Because it is affecting my children. I know I've, freely, I've spoken freely tonight and probably some of you are in shock. But why am I considered radical for speaking openly like I live in a free country? I mean, we do live in a democracy, I assume still. You see, this toxic trans ideology is utterly wrong. And our government have not only to rescind these changes, they have to stop pushing this entire ideology in our schools. Let me say this. They did not consult us as parents when they brought this in. They might have had some sort of a a, a side group somewhere, but they did not consult parents. They did not have our permission and they did not have authority to push this ideology. The government of Ireland is guilty of reckless endangerment and so tonight I want to finish by mentioning three simple issues regarding the Minister for Education. One, she promoted an ideology in place of fact-based education. Two, She promoted an ideology that is dangerous to the very children placed under her care, especially given that other countries are raising concerns about the promotion of gender ideology among children. And three, she persistently um, has refused to engage with us as church leaders and is determined, seems determined to follow on a path that is at odds with the deeply held beliefs of many and it is kind of, uh, uh, beliefs that are, you know, and, and uh, pushing a, a, an agenda that is against God's word and has decided to press on regardless of the concerns that have been raised. And let me say this, any teaching that cannot be questioned is a danger to society. And so in light of this, we're publicly calling on the minister of education to resign. Do the honorable thing and resign. This this is not a knee-jerk reaction. In March, we wrote a letter to the government. It was signed by 250 church leaders, both north and south, representing tens of thousands of parents, requesting to meet with the minister to discuss our concerns, and to date, they have refused. And so it would appear that the government is actively working against us to, uh, and, and, and let me say this, I, I believe they need to be replaced with an alternative family-friendly friend, government. Because, I apologize for speaking so long. But let me say this, the government and RTE have been working hand in glove for a number of years now. And both of them have this in common. Neither is fit for purpose and need to be replaced. Thank you, everybody, uh, for uh, keeping with us and staying with us uh, so far. Um, there's two things that I wanted to mention now. So that we're going to have a Q&A section right after for all of our speakers. Um, but before that, so I, I initially spoke about uh, joining CBI uh, as a member. Um, that membership is free at the moment. Um, uh, however, we still have costs to run, you know, uh, keeping the lights uh, on and uh, doing the videos and all of these things. Um, and they take money. So, uh, you know, we're, we're not uh, trying to, you know, if you don't feel comfortable, you don't have to, but if you, uh, you, you, you're happy with what you're seeing and you would like to support us, we are dependent on a, of the donations of people that want to give. Uh, there should be a, a QR code there to, um, uh, to scan with your camera and just uh, 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 give through PayPal and, and, uh, or, or bank transfer. So uh, I pretty, mo- pretty much appreciate it to get behind us, support us, and uh, work together to shine a light in this world. 
Um, so now we have a, a Q&A a Q and a code. Uh, Pastor John, have you got the, the yeah. question? Okay, very good, thank you. Great, so we're gonna go into Q&A. Um, so I, I have a question here, um, it's uh, anonymous and it says, uh, how can I ensure that my kid is not taught gender ideologies against my faith in school? Is there a way I can oppose this? Thank you. Uh, well, I suppose just, just for myself, I just want to throw it out there is that, uh, you know, we, we emailed our school and we explained about the uh, SPHE, uh, you know, that we wanted our, our child removed from it. Um, they, they responded. And again, I would encourage if you have any engagement, whether with a teacher, a principal, a politician, please be respectful. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we may not always be able to agree with people, but the least we can do is be kind and respectful. I think that's, you know, that's the minimum that is expected from us, um, irrespective of what faith you are of. But um, the issue is the school came back to me saying, well, you know, um, if you want him taken out uh, of the entire SPHE, then uh, you're going to have to bring him into school later. I said, well, that's not possible. He's, he's in a bus and both my wife and myself work. Uh, he goes to school on the bus. They said, well, we don't have anywhere to, to any staff to, to, you know, take care of him. And uh, I said, well, look, we have a problem then. And uh, I said, because uh, I didn't cause this problem, the Department of Education has. Mm -hmm. And so they're going to have to fix it. And I said, I'll be honest, I said, this, this is going to happen all around the country to hundreds of schools, I said, because, uh, you know, there are people who have a problem with this. But, um, and so just, just, I suppose, for parents to be forewarned is that they are going to come back to you with this idea that you have to come in and out of the school to collect your child. But um, I, I don't think that's, uh, I, I, again, I'm not a, a lawyer, I'm not a solicitor, but um, it, it certainly doesn't seem to be in line with the, 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 uh, the line from the Constitution I read there. And, um, and so I, I guess we're going to see where, where that goes. But th th did anybody else want to jump in there? I think uh, I, I was speaking to Education Minister Norma Foley earlier in the year at a press event and I was asking her about some of these more controversial materials that are being taught in classrooms and she insisted that she was very uh, a strong proponent of parental consent and making sure that nothing was taught against parental consent and that she was going to make sure that this was there was an opt-out clause and so on. And, that's all well and good. It remains to be seen if that will be the case when everything is said and done. But what I thought after hearing that was, it's sort of unusual that when we're talking about highly inappropriate materials, you would have to opt out of that. You know, it seems more unusual that you have to sort of isolate yourself as a child. You know, your people, other, other kids in the class are going to be wondering, well, why doesn't he attend the same classes that I do? And then you're kind of putting a target on your own back socially to be... Uh, declared some sort of uh, backwards troglodyte because you don't want to learn about the latest SPHE ideology that they have injected into the classroom. So I even think the opt-out model, as, as obviously it's better than nothing, you'd rather you have that choice than not have it. I still think it's wrong that it's being taught at all in the first place. I, I, I shouldn't have to deliberately pull my child out of learning something that's absolutely crazy, you know? Yeah. Yeah, amen. And, and, you know, there is that aspect of the, st the stigma, you know, that, that yeah. you know, nobody wants their kid to be the one that, that is the, that's the odd one out, you know, and I think that's, that's, I mean, look, if we as adults, some of us, whatever age, feel that peer pressure, I mean, how much more, you know, do teenagers and, and, and pre-teenagers pre, pre feel that? I just, I just want to throw it out there for, um, if you want to ensure that your kid is not exposed to what you don't want them exposed, you're going to have to know what they're exposed to. So mm -hmm. you would have to educate yourself in this. You would have to make the effort to pick up those books and to go through them and ask your child questions, a lot of questions, keep engaging with them because if they communicate with you, you would know where they're at, you would know where the class is at and if you don't agree, um, it's, you have to speak out because if you do not speak out, who is gonna speak out for your child? Mm -hmm. So. Amen. Um, another question: Do you know any website or books in which I could look at, in which I could look at the new SPHE course material? Um, the Parents Alliance have quite yeah. a lot of inf uh, helpful information. Um, I think that's ParentsAlliance.ie. Um, ParentsRightsAlliance.com. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, for the senator, um, how can we make our voice heard to the government? And what would you recommend: a protest or signed petition? Oh gosh. 
<laughs> we, we, if we know how, how much the government like protests. Um, um, look, I think it's, it's really important that you know the legislation that protects parents um, and the rights you have as a parent with a child going to school. And that um, section nine of the Education Act is really, really important. And if the schools have failed to consult with you, they're breaking the law. That is the reality of it. They're breaking the law. They must consult with the parents with regard to the education that they're teaching your child. So I suppose really what I would say to you is go to your principals, go to your board of management, write to your board of management and ask them what consultation have they taken with the parents in relation to the introduction of this new curriculum. And you will find that they have probably done none. So therefore, you're within your rights to report them for breaking the law. That is the reality. They are breaking the law. They are legally obliged under section 9D. A school should provide education to students which promote the moral, spiritual, and social and personal development of students and provide health education for them in consultation with their parents and having regard to the characteristic spirits of the school. So that's the legislation. You've got to use the legislation that's there. Uh, I, I, might, I might just add to that, that um, you know, a lot of people at election time when a politician comes to their door, be it for the council elections or the, the general election or whatever it might be, uh, the, if it's a candidate that they know they're obviously not going to vote for, you know, if it's, there's some certain parties that you would never consider voting for, we all have different, you know, views about wh who we support and so on, uh, a lot of people will just say, oh no, I'm not interested, and, and basically send them away. I, I would say that it'd be good to actually engage with the politician and let them know that this is something that's very, very important to me. And e e even if you would never vote for them, maybe tell them, I won't vote for you because you don't support this kind of thing. Because I think it's very easy for them to discount one person like that. It's very easy for them to discount two people like that. But if every door they're knocking on, this whole thing about SPHE curriculum is really worrying me, keeps coming up again and again and again, that is going to filter back to HQ. That will make an impact on them. And even if they don't care at all about the issue itself, they care about their own seats, they care about their careers. So I think that people should probably be a bit more proactive in trying to create election issues, make this a pivotal subject that parties have to weigh in on if they want to get a vote from anybody and, and talk about it and make that known to people in a, in a very generalized way. And I think yeah. the, more, the more we talk about these things, it's like the, the, uh, the erosion of the word woman out of the Constitution. Even though it, the, all these things are hidden within legislation, and that particular uh, word woman was taken out of the Work-Life Balance Bill. Now, you would have never thought that you would have found this piece of legislation that were trying to take out the word woman. Mm. So you really have to watch legislation that they're putting through at ev every single time. Um, so, like... They roll back on that. They've now sort of gone into the cupboards when it comes to the erosion of women in the home because they can't even define what a woman is. So therefore, they've gone, they, they've gone to the hills with that one. I saw someone say they were dreading me asking them about that all. all right, often. okay. That, that was going to be the whole, yeah. the rest but of even, the year. Even the, the free speech legislation too. They're, they're, becoming, they're becoming afraid of that as well. So I think the more you highlight issues, the more afraid they become. Mm. And they will run for the hills. So that's where we really want them. We don't want them pushing this gender ideology on our children. I really don't care. I shouldn't say I don't care, but when you're an adult, you can make that decision. Mm -hmm. But while you're a child, we need to do everything we can to protect the children that's there. Yeah. And I say that as a, as a, as a parent, but also as a, pa a foster parent of over 100 children. And I've yeah. seen some horror stories, you know, that have come inside my door over the years and how vulnerable these children are. And those children and these children and all our children need protection at all levels. So I would ask you to please, please stand up, get out there, talk to your neighbours, talk to your friends, talk to other members of your church. And like, and like you said, it's not just about the, the, the pastors and the priests and the imams. It is important that we get consensus among all faiths.
this is this is an all faith issue. This is about our our children and our family. Mm -hmm. So please stand mm -hmm. up. And you know. Thank you. And you know, there, there are people within, whether Fianna Fáil, Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, Sinn Féin, etc., who don't agree with this, but, you know, it's symptomatic of what's happening in our society where people are maintaining a polite silence out of fear of losing their job or fear of being cancelled or fear of being attacked. Uh, but, you know, I do believe there's a time and a place to speak up and to stand up and be counted. And, um, and you know, I honestly believe some of these parties need to be punished at the polls. Um, if, if they're not willing to, uh, you know, stand up, uh, because many of them, it, it's against their conscience. Um, they, they don't agree w with what is happening, and yet they're remaining silent. And, um, you know, we need men and women of integrity in, in positions of, of influence. And, and, uh, and, and again, we, we really appreciate uh, 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 Senator um, uh, Kyogen coming here tonight. Um, and having the conviction to do so, because this wasn't the popular thing for you to do. I'm sure you had lots of advice to not do this, and, and it's, it's always easier to keep your head below the parapet. But, but again, I, I mean, I believe this is a day where we need men and women of conviction, because it's men and women of conviction to make the world a better place. I, I might just... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I mean to kill the applause there. I might just add on that, that uh, earlier this year, speaking of the, the privilege stuff, teaching children that they're inherently privileged depending on where they're from or what race they come from, I, I asked uh, Tanish to Michal Martin about this because it was a proposal rolled out under his education minister, Norma Foley is from Fianna Fáil, so this is very much under his remit, and I asked him if he believed that people are privileged just because they're male or just because they're Irish, let's say. And he said he didn't believe that. He, di he didn't think that people had inherent privilege. So, and then he went on to say that he wasn't familiar with this and that he didn't know anything about it and it has nothing to do with me and that, that typical obfuscation. But what that says to me is, whether, whether that's true or not, he, he clearly realized this is an indefensible position. I don't get the impression that Michal Martin believes in this stuff or believes in 20,000 genders. I mean, how could he? You know, I don't, I don't believe that. I get the impression, listening to Minister Norma Foley, who I don't know, but you, know, you, have, you see clips of these people and you interact with them in a, in a small way. She seems like a perfectly nice, normal lady. I don't get the impression that she's passionately supportive of these kinds of issues. I think a lot of politicians feel held hostage by a very, very vocal fringe minority in their own departments, civil servants, or just kind of the baying mob more generally, the NGO sector. And one piece of evidence I might point to, and this is just conjecture on my part, but I did an interview last week with uh, Fine Gael TD, Charlie Flanagan, who is a former justice minister, and I asked him the question, what is a woman? And he answered it the, the correct way. He said a woman is an adult human female, and everybody was kind of amazed by this because they thought, wow, a government politician answering that question in a dead-on yeah. way, how refreshing. And then a couple of days later, he announced that he's not running for re-election. So, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not taking any credit away from him, but I, I think that once somebody has nothing left to lose, once he's going to be out of here in the next election, he kind of feels a bit freer to sort of say what he had probably been thinking all along, you know? And so I'm not, I'm not being critical of him, but I'm just saying how many other politicians, if they thought they had nothing left to lose, would just blurt out the obvious that we all yeah. know to be true and that they know to be true as well, you know? Yeah. Amen. Could, could I just say that before, before I came on stage tonight and when I met Pastor John, um, today in my office I got a phone call to not come here tonight. <laughs> Do not speak here tonight. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that I've come because... Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I have been speaking out for, uh, for many years, for the three years that I've been in there, I think I was one of the first to highlight the Tavistock clinic uh, issue with regards to the children attending that clinic. Um, I've spoken out uh, about the surrogacy issue, which I, the commercialization of children I find appalling. Um, I've spoken out about um, the rights of the unborn. I've spoken out about the, the sex education in our schools. 
uh, and sexualisation of our children. But more, some, some people were asking me, why wasn't I at the protest last Wednesday? And actually, I was on my way into the door last Wednesday. And I got a call, and I, I think this, we, we really need to listen to this, because there's a lot of children out there, and teenagers particularly, that are, are suffering. I got a call when I was on my way in from a parent, and she said, Sharon, uh, my daughter is self-harming. Hmm. That was my third call in two weeks. My, my third phone call of teenagers, young girls that are self-harming. So we have a crisis on our hands with regards to our young children mm -hmm. and their mental health. And we need to really talk about that. That is something we need to be talking about. Because um, that feeds into what is happening here. What they're seeing on their, on their mobile phones, what is trendy. They're watching TikTok. Self-harming seems to be some sort of a phase that uh, is happening within first and second years in school. Um, I would have had many children over the years that would have come into my care who would have been self-harming. And some of those children don't realise that those scars never go away. Mm -hmm. They don't go away. So body positivity is something that we should all be talking about for our children, for our young girls and for, and for boys, because self-harming doesn't necessarily mean it's all about the girls. It is too about the boys, but more so about the girls. So I turned my car and I went back to speak to that parent and that child last week. And, and I now find that uh, I didn't make it into the doll uh, because I had to go to a colleague had died, uh, one of my council friends had died, and I had to go to the wake. So I didn't make it in to the protest. But nevertheless, political commentators and radio hosts were blaming Sharon Kogan, the far-right senator, uh, for all the agitation that was caused on the streets of Dublin last week. <coughs> they wouldn't lace my shoes with the work that I do for people in my community. And I find it absolutely offensive that they would attack my faith. They mm. laughed at my faith on the radio. I, I am absolutely fed up of being called a bigot, a racist, a homophobe, a transphobe. All of these things that I've been labelled over the years. And I'm absolutely sick of it. I am none of those things. I live my faith out to be a good Christian, to be compassionate and loving to all my people, all the people that I come before me every day, of all faiths, of all colours, it doesn't matter to me. And I am fed up, like I'd say many people in this audience are, of being labelled. Mm -hmm. It is just shocking that that's the way that they try and punish people who stand up to speak the truth. And I will continue to speak that truth. Um, for Teresa, what would you recommend for other parents to do when faced with these changes? Well, I think it is important to um, make sure that your child is okay. Um, some children react to these things much harder than other kids, and you cannot prevent them from hearing these things anymore. Believe me, I've tried everything that I could. So. I think it is really important to make sure that if your child is really affected by what they are exposed to in school, to act on that. That is your first priority. Uh, we did just that. One of our children um, were really affected by, by a couple of things um, over the last couple of years, and we decided to take her out of public school. And uh, we have actually, we are so blessed, we, we have um, her in Britannia Christian School. Um, I highly recommend it. <laughs> it was worth every penny spent. And it's really helped her a lot um, to just get back to herself. And so that's the first thing I would say. Do whatever you can to make sure that your child is good um, emotionally. Um, they are under so much pressure with depression and anxiety and because these topics are too heavy for them to carry like yeah. Pastor John has said and they wonder why our kids suffer with depression and anxiety it's because they are teaching them things that they are not ready to hear so yeah. if you find this in one of your children I would definitely address the issue I would go and see the, the, the teachers and, um, and um, I would definitely remove them from that class I know it's not ideal but it's at least something that you are legally allowed to do and it's one step I would take, and if it goes so far, remove them. Amen. 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 Thank you. Um, uh, guys, I'm going to need a handheld in, in a second. Uh, please, if you could sort that. Um, 
how should college students who oppose this agenda respond to this as it's also being pushed in college? Thank you. Great question. Do you want to go for it? Because it's been pushed in, in colleges for the last, I'd say, 10 to 15 years, uh, yeah. this particular agenda. Uh, I mean, the education system has always been a hotbed for this stuff, but particularly colleges and universities. That's where it's sort of a lot of these ideas stem from originally in the first place. And uh, when I was in college years ago, I was just I just went for the brute force approach, and I gave a presentation in class about being pro-life, and just, just totally <laughs> ran down the uh, the middle of the aisle screaming my beliefs. I don't know if I would have still done it like that if I if I went back. Um, I I think. It's, it's, it's very difficult because you don't want to socially isolate yourself. You know, nobody wants to become a pariah. But I think you'd also be surprised how many people uh, in, in your class, in your year, are of a similar view and just might not have the moral courage to say it necessarily. I mean, should this, we all experience this. How many times have you been getting a haircut and you start talking to the barber and as soon as the, the topic starts to veer towards politics, you realize this person's on totally the same wavelength. Or taxi drivers, there's another one, you know? Like, people that you run into on a day-to-day uh, -day basis. There's so many more people who think the way we think than we realize. And so, I'd say the best way to do it is to befriend people in your college class, strike up co normal conversations with them about normal things, and once they've gotten to know you and they realize that you're not the deranged psycho that they think every, anybody who disagrees with them is, then you can start to broach some of these subjects and say, oh, by the way, I, this is how I feel about this issue, or, you know, by the way, I'm a religious person, or whatever it might be, and then they, they know you at that point. It's a one-to-one interaction so they can't misconstrue or get a bad first impression of you, you know, that kind of way. So yeah. just be normal and, and make friends. That, that would be my advice. Yeah. And I think mm -hmm. people of faith as well, um, children of faith and teenagers of faith and young people of faith, there's a different aura about them. Mm. Uh, they're, they're, we, I think children of faith have a different aura. Um, they have that spirit um, that is magnetic for other people to be around. You're a good person. You're a kind person. You're a compassionate person. Irrespective of the difference that you might see around you, you will still have that compassion in your heart to talk to people, to embrace people, to open up to people, and, and to even argue gently with people and get your points across without being disrespectful. People of faith have that. So if you've got your faith, don't be afraid to, to use your faith. And don't hide behind your Christian faith and your Christianity. We're there, to, we're, we're there in life to show God's way and show Jesus working through us. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's important that every day we get up. I get up every day. I pray to God every morning to get me up every day to do the work that I have to do. And at night I, I get into bed and I always think, God, I've had a good day. I've had a good day today. I, I hope I've helped somebody in my life. Mm. And I think that has to be for the same with Christianity and Christ, all, all our Christian children. Uh, we have a different aura about us. We are more open. We are more caring. There is more kindness within us. Despite what they might say, we have to always believe that God is with us. Yeah. God yeah. is with us. I know God is with me. And that is why I'm able to do the things that I'm able to do. And I'm sure he's with all of us here mm. tonight. So I, and not to be afraid to tell, tell people that you are a Christian, that you're Catholic, that you're a Protestant, whatever your faith may be, don't be afraid of it. Cause, we cause should in not many, fear. Because in many ways, the most persuasive thing is just being a good example of what you want the, the world to be. You know, you can, you can have arguments with people for hours, you can lay out all of the, the points you believe in and make different logical uh, explanations of your position, but sometimes it's just more persuasive to just be it and just let other people see, wow, this is a, this is a Christian person or this is a religious person I know and they're a, they're, they're a really nice person and you know, that, that makes people think and, and it, it can strike a chord with them in a way that words can't sometimes. Yeah. And you know, and I think there's a direct correlation actually between the reduction of, uh, you know, faith teaching and people having faith and, and the increase in, in mental health issues. And uh, because, yeah. 
as, as Christians, we believe that your, your mental health is, is linked to your spiritual health. And, and that, that's something I know secular governments don't like to acknowledge, but, you know, the, I mean, it, 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 it's a fact, is, you know, the Bible says this hope we have is an anchor for our soul. And so when you have that anchor in the midst of the storms of life that come to all of us, it, it really does make a difference being able to, mm. like the song goes, bring it to the Lord in prayer. But, you know, I just wanted to ask Pastor Tunde, as, as somebody who has lived in, in the UK before here and before that, obviously, um, Nigeria, um, uh, uh, firstly, uh, uh, how, how do you feel regarding the difference between, say, you know, the political correctness that, that seems to be here in, in Ireland compared to the UK and, and, and also compared to in, in Africa, particularly regarding you know, being open about your faith and, 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 you know, the belief in gender, the sanctity of life, etc. Well, I'll start with Africa. In Africa, there's no um, big hoo-ha about political correctness. In Africa, they say it as it is. Um, as a lot of us realize, the American government tried to put Africa under pressure when it came to this whole homosexual, lesbian stuff and they fought against it. Um, when it comes to Africa and what they believe, they stand firm. I spent a lot of time in England, and um, I came to Ireland 15 years ago. I came to Ireland believing Ireland is, I say is, I wouldn't say was, is a Christian nation, you know? But a lot of things have changed. In England, you wouldn't call England or the UK a Christian nation anymore. Um, things have changed dramatically. But it's unfortunate because we're seeing the same thing here in Ireland. You know, a, a lot of our Christianity, a lot of um, the Catholic um, faith is being eroded. But I'm trusting God that things will be reversed. Amen. Trusting God that things will be reversed. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You know, I think it's important we don't, you know, attack personalities, mm -hmm. but I do think it's important we deal with policies and that they're not beyond criticism or scrutiny, um, irrespective of what somebody's mm. um, sexual orientation is. And so, um, but again, this is where I think as, as Christians, we, we do have to find our voice and recognize that we can't just ignore what's happening in our society. And, um, you know, just, just like the senator is making a difference, not just you know, in her political career, but in her daily life by, by being kind and by fostering and by changing the lives of those children. And I think if, if we could all do that, you know, we could make this country a, a, be, a better place. Mm -hmm. And so that was our hope and our aspiration with tonight would be to inform you as parents. And um, like I said, we have 100,000 flowers that we've printed and uh, I'd like, um, you know, you to take them back to your, your churches, your parishes, your, your mosques, wherever, and, and just, um, it, it's, it's a simple flyer that just distills what the issues are for you as a parent regarding to this ideology. And, um, and so we, we hope that that's going to be helpful. And so um, we're just going to uh, close in prayer tonight. Uh, is Pastor Bong here? Okay, we're going to get a, a group photo. If any of the um, uh, uh, pastors and ministers could come up here, priests, bishops, imams, whoever. We'll get one of the five of us together. So if we can just stand, that would be great. That's it. Okay, uh, so if there's any uh, uh, pastors, priests, religious leaders, imams, whatever, that would like to come up, we'll just get a picture together. That would be a nice way to finish. And then we're going to have flowers. Yes, and sorry, we have the uh, day of prayer in Belfast, the end of um, October. That's the, uh, I think if, if you can put the poster up there, that'd be uh, great. Just want to, I really believe this nation needs prayer. Uh, this island needs prayer, both north and south. And um, so, yeah, that's the uh, 29th of October in uh, Belfast at 3 p.m. And uh, so, just really appreciate. Could you just show your appreciation to all these men and women? Thank you so much. Thank you. Again, this isn't just for, for Christian leaders. Whatever religious leader you may be, please, we, we welcome you up here. We just want to stand in, in, in solidarity, just stand in agreement on behalf of our children. Okay, I have three things to uh, pray over before we will close this uh, 
meeting. Number one is, we will pray for this government that children will be raising right now, and we will bring them into the government. Yeah. Are we agreeing this one? Yeah. Can we get amen? <laughs> and number two is, we will pray for this land that there will be more Christian schools to be open in this land. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? And number three is, the answer of this is in the tip of your tongue. We will pray for our children, to the government, to every uh, uh, section of this, uh, uh, of this uh, I mean, government right now that they will hear our voice. Amen? Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray that tonight the answer will be received for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for every denomination in here. Every people who are gathered here to raise their voice. Not to be silent, but to raise their voice. Not to protest, but to raise their voice. Lord, hear our prayer. We come here today for in an agreement that every words, that every uh, needs of our children, our future children, and our future of these children will be heard as well. Right now, Lord, we pray to you that everyone will open their mouth not to be silent. And today, even though the lion will be shut their mouth, because we have God who knows the answer. And right now, we believe that we can have this, and we can have this answer through Christ and through every one of us here tonight, that we will be going home, and we will have the answer for our children. We thank you for everyone who has been gathered here and for everyone who raised their voice so that the government will hear our prayer. Thank you, Lord, and thank you, Jesus, and thank you, God, for everything. In amen. Jesus' mighty name, pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. We so appreciate all of you.